Hello everyone, sorry I'm a few minutes late, um, but we're all here now and, and lovely to see you. Hope you've been sort of managing to, to, to hold on to the ship in the first few weeks back from term. We were just chatting about it just now and sort of, I know that all, all available spare time is getting sponged up with everything that's going on, but hope you're coping well uh, and thank you for, for attending the webinar today. It's been, been really bowled away by the, the level of interest that we've had for this event so far, so it's lovely to have you all here. Uh, my name is Richard Angus. I'm head of education partnerships here at my tutor. Um, and really, the purpose of this webinar is at, well, I suppose, uh, as you already, you, some of you may be aware, some of you may not be, uh, and might be on a fact finding mission. The National Tutoring Programme is, is coming soon. It's a, it's a scheme designed to, to give students access to heavily subsidised, high quality tuition uh, for disadvantaged students to help them catch, that, catch up on, on any lost lockdown learning. Um, schools will be able to access the scheme from November. Um, with much of the tuition likely to be delivered online um, to mitigate things like local lockdowns, all that kind of stuff. But while a lot of schools might be familiar with online tuition and running it, actually for a lot of people, it's, it's relatively new. So this webinar really is to, to demystify um, that, that form of tuition uh, uh, and to talk about how it works in practice. And so we'll give you a brief overview of, of how the NTP works um, and a brief introduction to my tutor, but then what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll bring on the speakers. So um, Nikki Graham, who's the executive principal of, of Harris Academy Chafford 100, uh, and Will Doyle, uh, vice principal of, of Ride Academy, uh, who both join us today. And what they'll be able to do is, is hopefully give you some concrete insights and ideas to take away um, for, for how you approach this sort of thing this year, if you haven't done before. Um, during the webinar, if you'd like to submit a question to any one of the speakers, um, please just type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom. Uh, you can also upvote other people's questions. So if they've got something that you think is brilliant, just put a thumbs up there and we're more likely to see it. Um, so so that's, how, that's how it all works. Um, so these are our guest speakers, as I say, Nicola Graham and Will Doyle, who you'll be hearing through. Will, you're, you're smirking. Is this is a less favourite favorite shot? <laughs> it's not my greatest photo. Thanks for that. <laughs> Well, you know what? I, well, I think it's fine. It's just a sunny day. So, um, shall we? Uh, just uh, we'll start with just a very brief overview of my tutor, and then an outline of, of how, what the NTP is and how it's working in sort of its rough uh, dimensions. So, um, we are a, an online tuition platform designed to reinforce classwork and, and, and fill learning gaps. So. What we do is we match your students with top university tutors um, who are who are subject knowledge, subject experts, but also trained to be able to deliver the content really well. And I suppose some of the benefits there are that they're closer in age, they've got recent exam experience and can provide a different angle to, to what goes on in the school day. So we do things across key stage three, four and five um, and have been going for about five years now. Um, so obviously, you know, schools that you'll be hearing from we've supported in the past, but Obviously, this year is a slightly different year, and, and, and there's a there's a lot more going on. So, um, on flexibility, the fact that it's online means that sessions fit around your students' timetables and a, a live, personalised tuition session. I'll show you a little picture of what they look like, and and one to one tuition um, ranges from about twenty two to twenty six pounds an hour. Um, We've got an impact report that we'll share. We didn't do one this year because of the way results panned out. It would sort of be a little bit, it would be a little bit basing it on some interesting data this year. Um, but we have a few years of good historical data that show that around about 10 sessions, uh, you could expect your students to make about a grade of progress. Um, so that's, that's a little bit on us just to, to start off with. Um, the, the last bit's just on our tutors. So um, as I say, um, only one in eight are selected. Uh, they're subject specialists, which, you know, they've got great grades, but it doesn't make you a good tutor. It just makes you smart. So they're all personally interviewed, trained and onboarded to make sure they can deliver great lessons in school. Uh, and we do them at all times of the day, which I'm sure the guys will come on to a little bit. So um, that's a little image of what they look like. You can imagine here in the top right hand corner, you've got something that looks a little bit like like Zoom, I suppose, now and that you can see and hear each other. On the left hand side, this is big white interactive board that. Um, people can uh, write on, upload past papers to. The idea is it's an interactive session, not a lecture, a little bit like today. So that's a little bit on my tutor and a little about how we work. In terms of how the National Tuition Programme is going to work, um, essentially the government is heavily subsi uh, sub subsidizing tuition to around about 250 to 300,000 students. Um, they're going to be delivered by what they're calling tuition partners. And if anyone tells you anything differently, no one's been confirmed yet. Um, but uh, we suspect we'll be one of those partners. And so 
they have to have experience already working with schools. This isn't something where they're just going to be delivering it um, having never done it before. Formally, the, the list will get published from the 31st of October and schools can start from November. Um, essentially, the subsidising looks like about 75% will be paid for by the government. The interesting thing to note, though, is that this is mostly going to be delivered as three to one group tuition online um, well, or in person. So um, you might, you'll have three students to one tutor. And so what most schools are doing is they're saying, right, we've got our one to one core provision that we know students need as individualized support. But then we've also got some heavily subsidized government tuition that we can also add to those groups that perhaps need a little bit less direct support. Um, and we can talk about that in a bit more detail. But I think thinking of it as sort of this one to one and then there's this NTP three to one stuff that sits on top of it is a nice way of, of thinking about it. So that's a little bit about the National Tuition Programme. Always happy to answer more questions on that sort of separately to this um, if that's useful. But I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview for people who didn't already know that it exists. So that's a little bit of chat about my tutor and a little bit about the National Tuition Programme. Um, and with that, I think that brings us to our, our first presenter of the day, which is going to be Nikki Graham. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen just now. Uh, and then Lauren and Nikki, do you want to take us away from there? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Lauren, you're going to present the slides for me, aren't you? Sorry, I'm on mute. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to do that now if you give me one. Excellent. Minute. Thank you. Can you guys see that? I can see it. Perfect. Okay. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the introduction, Richard. Um, we started with the My Tutor programme after meeting with Richard last year. And I'm just going to talk you through our experience. So next slide, Lauren. Thank you. Um, so why did we choose this program to begin with? I must say that when we looked at it, we felt that the program offers a, a real value for money option to reach a number of students uh, that we felt would really benefit from guided support from an expert in the field. My tutor were open to us playing a very active role in driving the content of the tuition. This meant that we always knew um, what, the, what we were covering in those sessions would be very relevant to each individual. They offer one-to-one -one sessions and we felt that with groups there is inevitably variability in the understanding of the students um, and also you get some reluctance to ask questions in front of other people uh, and much less so when it's one-to-one -one, where you can really focus on what your needs are as a student and it's really about the individual student just about what they need what they're understanding um, and adds to the comfort factor. We'd not long completed a set of mock examinations and had a very thorough overview of the areas in which the students were secure and not secure. We were able to plan to use this evaluation uh, to shape the content of the intervention uh, with the individual tutors. Thank you, Lauren. Choosing the students. Now for us, it seemed logical to work with a group of students that we felt uh, really did have the potential to reach their thresholds, be that level four or level five, according um, to their starting points and according to their potential. But we also wanted something that would stretch and challenge a group of more able students that were going to struggle to, to reach those grades eight and nine and may have fallen short otherwise. We also tried to aim for students who um, needed support in two core subjects because that would enable us to plan support in two areas and use the tutors efficiently. Thank you, Lauren. Setting it up, I think this is very individual to your own particular environment. Um, for us, we felt it worked really well when we had the students together in a computer room. They all had headphones on, so they weren't interrupted by each other. 
but we had eyes on all of them and we could tell that they were all working um, and we really did feel that that took away any concerns that anyone may have about safeguarding we had the children in front of us we were able to see the interactions with um, the tutors and it helped us to secure the buy-in of parents as well knowing that someone was going to have an eye on them while they were actually doing the work some of it we were able to schedule during the core day uh, and you'll have your own circumstances but but you may like us sometimes review the number of subjects students are taking and reduce some particularly if they need to focus on some particular subjects such as core subjects uh, so we were able to come up with some sessions during the day that worked effectively for a group of students the rest of them we did after school uh, both options were very effective. We secured a member of senior staff to oversee it so that we got good feedback so that the atmosphere was always conducive to learning, which it 100 percent was. Um, and we were able to know that the students were making progress as well. We could also monitor the attitude of the students coming out of the sessions, uh, log the comments that they made. Uh, be able to see the work rate. Uh, so obviously, like, like most times, you will have some characters in there. Um, but we were always incredibly uh, pleased with the way that they worked with the, with the tutors, pleased with the interactions and the professional attitude of the tutors, um, and pleased with how well engaged our students were. Thank you, Lauren. And the last bit from me, how did it go? Well, obviously, um, we had a surprise in March when we realised we were going to have to close and that made it more difficult for us to gauge because um, we were then into the realms of predicting grades for students rather than carrying on towards exams. Um, so I can only give you a, an overview and assure you that we would definitely use it again. Students were, as I say, very engaged all the way through. The content was relevant and the fact that we were able to work together on that was incredibly useful. The tutors were very professional um, and very personable and worked well with a range of students. The top end students, the students that were struggling a little bit more, the students who were characters, they worked well with all of them. The students were actually really keen to come back and carry on. Um, and would have been keen to have done more. They weren't, they weren't ready to finish the session a lot of the time. Uh, and uh, anecdotally, they certainly felt that their understanding was more secure on the back of doing these sessions. That's my last slide. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I believe we're having questions later on. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, thanks very much, Nikki. That was very clear and I appreciate you presenting that in today. Um, brilliant. Uh, so we'll move on to the Q&A with that in a little bit later. Um, next up, we just wanted to introduce uh, Will Doyle, who's the Vice Principal over at Ride Academy on the Isle of Wight. Um, so Will, um, again, apologies about the photo. I thought it was fabulous. Um, <laughs> take, take, it, take it away when you're ready and, 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 and uh, lo lovely to see you. Okay, it's fantastic uh, to meet everyone today. Um, the way I've done, I'm not presenting slides, I'm going to run through our experiences down on Ride Academy, down in Ride Academy using my tutor. Um, um, I'm going to give you the tips that worked for us. I'll be honest, I'll tell you some of the things that didn't work so well for us. I hope it's useful. And I have said to the my tutor team at the end of this, if you want more information um they can give my email out and i'm happy to take emails as well so let me be very clear we're not the finished article and um, we are very much on a journey down here on the isle of wight the isle of wight education standards are well pub publicized and that's why we went for my tutor we needed to do something different to really drive forward our change um the key thing for us was parental engagement we were targeting the bottom 30% of our academy and we used the one-to-one -one tuition to support some of our most challenging students. Um, we did a GCSE success evening and we wanted to make it really, really, really special for the students. We wanted to make them feel like they, they're going to be engaged in something really special and we invited all the parents along. Um, my tutor provide fantastic literature for us to use, their own promotion videos, uh, letter templates, et cetera, et cetera. But um, 
with the with the parents that we were trying to engage we um, found what had a huge impact on buy-in and attendance was um, changing that to so it's us and it's our personal approach so we created videos where it's us talking to the parents about my tutor and that had a marked improvement on our um, attendance rates so to put that into some context um, we ran a summer holiday program and we offered 111 students throughout the summer holidays my tutor and that was completely engaged by us remotely because of lockdown and we got 79 percent attendance to put that into some context um, the education endowment fund ran a summer uh, program where they trialed online tuition and they had a 42 percent engagement rate um, the students have come back to school having had maths and science over the summer holidays. They've been fired up. They've been engaged. And I think um, from, we had our Ofsted pilot last week and we were talking about the use of my tutor to engage those challenging students during lockdown and over the summer period. And what Ofsted, they were really interested in was the soft data, actually, not the hard progress data. And they're asking about um, how the students felt, how the students reacted to that. Um, intervention if you like so we've brought in in reaction to that we've now brought in a survey where we continually surveying the students about how their attitudes to learning have changed and the greatest change that we notice in the students that partake in my tutor is their um, confidence levels go through the roof um, one thing that worked really well for us and Nikki alluded to it as well it has to be data driven and so um, we give all the students a QLA analysis of their mock papers, their strengths and weaknesses, the questions they struggled on, all topics they struggled on. Our students take that and it's shared with the tutors and the tutors are then only focusing on those bespoke gaps. And I think that's really powerful. Um, a little bit of work from your end, but the impact is greater. Um, this, so things that worked really well, Google meets with the parents we set up Google Classrooms just for all the information and we're constantly communicating with students. Something that didn't work well for us, every school's different. Um, we did it when they're in the school, the students were doing it after school as part of our lesson six provision. So in AET academies, all schools in year 11 go on till four o'clock and all the students stay till four and we call it lesson six. Um, what we found there was um, attendance became more challenging because students want to go to the lesson sixes and all their other revision and all their other subjects so we've moved it into curriculum time and the impact was transformational in terms of attendance and buy and so there's a tip from us there my second tip is is like Richard alluded to is sticking to 10 sessions rather than keeping it open-ended so joe blogs you're going to be doing my tutor the mistake i made was and you're going to stay on my tutor now we've set it to those 10 weeks and it makes it an achievable target and if the students make progress you swap students in and out um, we are employing a, a member of staff into the academy who's part of the role will be to be help and support running my tutor it's really important that you have that named person it was myself last year and now i want to disseminate that down to a, another member of staff so you have a named member of staff that um, supports the students in that room um, we found that rewards are intrinsic to the support to the success of my tutor so we we have a, a rewards pyramid with the students right at the top the greatest reward is the impact on your results but we um, provide students with tea and coffee um, every time they attend their my tutor session they have a passport that is called the prom passport you sign the signatures and it gets 10 percent off their prom ticket if they attend all their my tutor sessions um, the greatest reward for them though is the results and that's what we always hammered home um, i hope those little tips and those little bits of advice that have worked for us have helped. If you do have any questions or you want some more clarification, um, you can ask them at the end or please do email me. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you, Will. Um, and thank you, Nikki, as well. Um, I've seen quite a few questions come in from people. So if um, you guys are happy, I'm going to launch into some of the questions that we've had um, from attendees. So let's kick off. Um, so Will, I think you might have touched on this sort of just now, um, but we have one person asking, what curriculum time did you use? Which subjects? So uh, within our curriculum, 
we used a little bit of the core PE. Core PE is vital for those students and they need that time to blow off steam. But we've got, um, we cut into that a little bit, but we also have timetable two hours every two weeks, one hour a week. We have a two, two week rolling timetable. We use the PDL time, which is their personal development and learning time. And we cut into that a little bit because um, these students, it's vital for them that we've got these um, KPIs, these key performance indicators, subjects your English in mass um, nailed away. So we, we sacrificed a bit of curriculum there. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and so Nikki, one for you actually. Um, you mentioned that tutors covered two subjects in your um, My Tutor sessions. Um, people were wondering, did you have those two subjects running at the same time within the one session? No, generally they were, they were timetabled separately. Okay, makes sense. Uh, follow up one for you, Nikki, um, before you go. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. was, um, someone was wondering, uh, have you only used the programme this year or is it something that you've used previously as well? No, this is the first time we've worked with you. But it wasn't just here. We worked, um, you worked with us ac across uh, a number of federation schools in the area. Great, thank you. Um, okay, back to you, Will, in that case. Um, actually, in fact, this might be one for both of you. So this is a bit of a more general question around funding. So with the NTP, obviously we've spoken about the fact that it's sort of 75% funded by by the, the government and the NTP itself um, and people had questions about the remaining sort of 25% um, and people have asked how do you plan to fund that 25% um, have you got any thoughts on that how do you think schools um, could look at that or what what other possible pots could you look at for that so ask Nikki, shall I jump in first? Uh, so to, for us, um, before the national um, tutoring program was even mentioned, the way the funding worked for us is that the, the trust 50% funded the provision and we funded the other 50%. We're targeting, um, um, broadly speaking, SEN and pupil premium students. So the funding then came from our pupil premium budgets in that respect to fund the rest of the money. Yes, very similarly, I agree. Um, certainly pupil premium funding um, and we always try to keep some money aside, albeit that, that budgets don't make that easy these days, uh, to be able to offer some tuition to our exam cohorts. And this seemed like a, a good thing to spend it on. Brilliant, thank you both. Um, now Rich, there's quite a few questions on, on my tutor in general, so I might sort of put you on the hot seat now. Um, so uh, a few questions from people. Um, how do we measure impact? Good question. So uh, this year's impact report is obviously a bit of a pain. We, we, were, we were thinking about it, but honestly with the you know, the grade outcomes, it's, it's tricky to, you know, it's a different sort of beast, but uh, we've done it every year for the last few years and the methodology we, um, we were helped quite a lot with this with UCL. So essentially what we do is we take uh, a student and the, 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 the subject they're taking my tutor in uh, and we compare their, their grades on entry to a my tutor program, so their most recent mocks, with their final exam data. And then what we do is we compare that subject with the student themselves in their other sub in a, in a basket of other core subjects. So let's say, for example, we're looking at David in maths. We'll take a look at David's my tutor maths, and then we'll have a look at um, English and science and see the progress that he's made in other subjects. So what's nice about that is it provides a control for a lot of things around things like um, parental engagement, and a lot of things that you, are tough to control for if you compare. A student with a different student um, and that's how we that's that's our methodology on in terms of how we get there it, it's obviously not perfect but it works pretty well uh, and that's where we see um, that's how we typically measure our, our impact on a, on a yearly basis so um, will we'd have asked for what we typically do obviously is in the summer we'd ask for when when exam results come in we come in and we say hello could we could we get your final exam grade data please and then we we crunch that all together it's worth adding as well that we do that in schools as well so we baseline the students before they go in and then you're looking at their data because um, you want to swap students out. If they do then make the required progress and they're hitting their target grades, you can take them out and swap them in with a the student. So you're constantly baselining that impact as well. 
Thank you. Um, okay, so another one for you, Rich. I've seen quite a few questions on tutor training. Um, so a couple of things to this. Um, what training have my tutor tutors received? Um, obviously, um, our tutors are university undergraduates, um, but the exams may have changed since the tutors sat the exam. So how do we keep tutors on top of that? Um, given that UD curriculum is different. Um, so yeah, that's the first one. Yeah, and it's a good question. I think to Ned's question, actually, you know, obviously exams change over time. Uh, and so that's a really important thing to be making sure that that training is currently up to date. So um, I guess the short story is that they all get individually interviewed and then they get put through a 16 module training course. So basically we built that with with Teach First and, and, and teachers. We also have um, a director of education in the business as well to make sure that we're up to date. And so what we're doing is not just the building blocks of each subject, which obviously should hopefully, you know, many of the building blocks will remain the same year on year, but we also train them in curriculum nuance. So making sure they're on the right spec for the year ahead. Um, that's just an important thing that we need to refresh to make sure that that's, that's constantly uh, up to date. So that's sort of, that's how they get, that's how they get the trained. And then obviously beyond that, they also get spot check QAs in their first few lessons, particularly just to make sure that they're delivering that in the right way as well. Great, thank you. Um, another tutor training related question. Um, how do we train tutors to assess on entry or do we rely on schools to provide those targets? That's a good question and actually uh, possibly one for, for Will. So, so my, you know, my, my view on, our view on uh, in terms of assessment by the tutor, where we can get, obviously this year's QLA information might be a little patchier, um, but where we get um, information from schools in terms of, you know, what's their current grade, what's their target grade, and what are a few of those big learning gaps? That information, first of all, it's great to have heads of departments engaged in the process in the first place, um, but also it provides a great benchmark for our tutors in a way that, um, you know, we can't cover off quite as well as you can in school. And so in that way, I think it's actually quite a nice compliment. Will, how did, how did you do it when you were picking your students? So what's really, really important, first of all, the picking of the students, every school manages their data in a different way. We have a VEN and the key performance indicator that we use my tutor to focus on is the four four pluses and five pluses in the basics, your English and maths and the crossover in those. So it's really data driven there. But the key thing is, it's, you, you refer to it as the onboarding of students. So you have to fill out all the students' details, um, what board you do, and what topics are their strengths and weaknesses. And the more you front load that with a bit of the work and the more detail you put into that document and the more gaps that you highlight, when the tutor starts work with that student, it's it's there, it's front loaded, and they can simply crack on with the gaps because that's the power of my tutor. If you do broad brush strokes, you lose the impact. Where if it's Joe Bloggs can't do, um, he's struggling with circle theorems, so let's focus on circle theorems and get it cracked. And it's that, like I said, it's those soft outcomes about boosting their confidence in that topic. So, it, but if, when you onload the students, it's got, if you use the data and the gap analysis and you provide that to my tutor on the, the, the provided forms it's really powerful great thank you um so this is a, another question i'd like to sort of throw out there for for nikki and will um uh someone's asked have your schools launched have you tried launching a saturday school um at all um and if so how did you approach it and did it work Um, it's not something that we have done, but it is something that we're considering doing. Um, and I, I feel like it would work well. Uh, and it, and I think that they're very well versed at the moment in working, um, <laughs> virtually as well. So I think they would actually really enjoy doing that, um, and succeed well at it. Yeah. I, I think it, it's a worthwhile option, particularly now we, we, we need to do everything we've got to do to close gaps. Um, so it's certainly something that we're looking at at the moment. Yep. So we run a, a full Saturday school program and it rotates through all the core and back. It focuses on core and back. Um, it's three hours on a Saturday morning. Um, what we do is we do targeted, we call them master classes. They don't have to wear uniform. We give them tea and coffee. And if they complete the master class and they work really hard, they get a little bit of pizza at the end. Um, 
where it can be a challenge we work on favors and the staff do give up their time we're very fortunate we've got a, a fantastic hugely dedicated team of staff that do give up their saturday morning once every so often to do those sessions great thank you uh, thank you both um so a logistical question here um which would be interesting to hear from from both of you actually um in, in your own experience, how many students in a typical session? Well, I mean, Rich, you could maybe talk more broadly, but it, but then perhaps Will and Nikki, be, how many students did you have in your specific sessions? Uh, well, I can speak more broadly, I suppose, to start with, in, in terms of in any given session. Uh, it's sometimes it really, I was having a chat with someone about this today, actually, and, and I think it doesn't re there's no constraints but we have seen for example where a school might have and will you were doing quite a large amount of students so you might you might have a different opinion on this but you know where it gets to sort of an unmanageably large level for like the size of the room and everything else uh, we've had some schools that have tried to cram 50 kids into a room that, that hasn't and that and that hasn't necessarily worked effectively i think will when we originally spoke you were looking at doing sort of cohorts of 25 uh, during the school day and is that yeah. right yeah, that's so what we did. We 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 highlighted for our data that we needed to target 50 students that were underperforming and we split them into groups of 25. And we're fortunate enough in our academy, we've got the perfect venue. It's a computer room, but it's a very, very large computer room. So um, we use Chromebooks as well. Um, Chromebooks allow you to spread students out within a space. So if you've got access to Chromebooks, the, the mobility of those really, really helps. But any more than 25 i'd agree it becomes um quite difficult to manage yeah we talked i talked about in this in the chat this morning i talked about 30 as a bit of a sweet as a as a, as a manageable sweet spot you, you don't want to break it up into like tiny about tiny sections all, all day because then that's an admin over overhead um but yeah i think that's really really sensible nikki i don't know if you had a view on, on what you did at chaffet 100 i don't I'm, I'm not familiar with that yeah i would say we probably did more like 15 um, but whatever works, as long as you can have eyes on them uh, and you can make it an effective learning environment, then I think you probably could go up to 30. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so Rich, I've got a few um, my tutor sort of general questions for you. Um, people are asking. So firstly, um, is there provision for A-level? Good question. Yes, um, actually works really well at Key Stage Five. I can't remember Will if you did any any A level. Um, did, did that we, we, we yeah we dipped into it. We di we didn't plan to, but um, a situation arose with a particular student. So then we brought into some Key Stage Five, and it it worked even better than Key Stage Four actually. But the students are much more independent, and they can go into a private area if you're sixth form suites and they have study areas where they could go and have their lessons and they didn't need so much support in that does that make sense so it worked really well yeah and, and you know they're a little they're even closer in age so it can work really well the only, the only thing is it tends to again be in mostly in core subjects and, and obviously at a level you can split out a bit more so there's potentially some some subjects where we can't be as helpful Marek I think I saw a comment from you on 15 or 30 students each getting their own tutor that's right in that it's one-to-one -one, so the students each get their own individual tutor even if they're running at the same time and that's really important not so it's like a essentially another a, a classroom environment okay, great thank you um, another question which I think probably comes from uh, perhaps concern about local lockdowns and things like that for the school closures, but can students do tuition from home if they have internet access and a laptop? I think it might be worth you answering that one, Will, because I think you'd have probably done it, wouldn't you, during the period? Yeah, so we ran our summer holiday programme and the, um, it worked really, really well, but you have to work doubly as hard to make sure the students are accessing the lessons. So over the summer period, um, we we asked two members of staff, they were paid for their time, but the day before the, the tutor session was due in maths, every one of those students had a personal phone call to remind them to the parents and the students. Um, and what worked really well is we're very, very fortunate that AET during lockdown um, really through the, through the book and it really funded um, Chromebooks. So every single student had a Chromebook 
and any one of our students, which we did um, after our survey, it turned out that we had about 55 students that had no internet access at home. They lived off 4G on their mobile phones and things. Um, AET brought them all a dongle, an internet dongle, so everyone was internet enabled. Um, what we had to train all the students on is just, and the parents on, is where those sessions take place. And the students aren't to engage in my tutor in their bedrooms. It needs to be in the, a public space. And we always advised a dining room, a lounge, or a kitchen, somewhere like that, where it's, it's a public space. So that was a little bit of a safeguarding change that we had to put into place. But that was easily done through the, the, um, the video that we created for our parents. Because the reading age is what we found it with the parents we were targeting was really low. So if we just put it in some sort of literature, they would really, really struggle to access that literature. So we were creating videos and texting the links. Parents are very good with smartphones and texts. That's, that's a, a medium they're comfortable with. So they would get the link on the video. And that's, that's, that's how we managed to get the attendance as high as we did over the summer break. And, and that, and the only other thing I'd add to that, and, that, and that's very consummate, is that um, in normal times, if you can ever call it that, or when we ever we get back to, so what we're doing at the moment is, you know, where you've got students that you know that they're really engaged, they really are, you know, perhaps they're high retaining or they're, but they're very engaged with the process anyway, and you know they have the kids at home they're the ones that perhaps you can trust to do it at home. Um, and so a lot of schools do do a bit of a mix with those who are a bit more reticent. They might have it at the end of the school day or whatever and have other ones who, who are doing it from, from, from home. So there's a bit of a mix there. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another sort of logistical question that people are wondering, and this is probably one for Nikki and Will really, um, where we've spoken about sort of 10 week programs or, or different program durations, people are wondering, what does this actually look like so is that one lesson per pupil per week or is it three times a week how frequently are they um just would be good to hear your experience how was it in your programs it probably depends how many subjects you're doing so if you have students doing more than one subject it's probably best to keep it to one lesson per week um, but if you're only doing one subject and you want to immerse them in it i think you could do two hour long sessions um during the week and, and it would be very effective i think it's got to be curriculum driven as well so for us the slots they do two hours a week in one hour slots we do maths and science so they do an hour of maths a week and an hour of science a week and but that's driven by our curriculum more than anything so it fits with our timetable Great, um, thank you, um, very clear. Um, slightly more sort of uh, detailed question, this one. So a question from Karen here. Some teachers seem reluctant to use a system like this as they fear the students may become confused or conflicted with the stage they may be at in lessons. Have Will or Nikki experienced this or been able to, to overcome these concerns? Any thoughts? So, for our end, um, that's why you need the right member of staff managing the room. And then if there is any misconceptions or concerns raised, they can be dealt with. Um, personally, we've had no experience of any misconceptions or things being taught incorrectly or in the way that you don't want them taught. Um, so from my end, we haven't had any concerns like that. But it, it's monitored by those that are monitoring the room that the students are working in. Absolutely agree. Yeah, it, you really do need that key person in the room. Um, and we didn't have any experience of that happening. Great, thank you both. Um, okay, a couple more questions about tutors, which I'm going to put to Rich. Um, so how this is really around our sort of tutor matching process. So are, are the tutors matched and does the school have any say on the matching process? So that's sort of part one. And then secondly, are tutors subject to DBS checks? Yeah, so I'll take the first one first. So 
Absolutely. There's a, there's a few quite important safeguarding bits. So the first one is that every tutor needs an enhanced TBS check. That's, that's pretty standard and just expected, I suppose. The other two things is that the, the tutor and student only know each other on a first name basis and they don't have contact outside the lesson space. They log into my tutor, they do their lesson, they're off again. And the last thing is that every session is recorded, which is brilliant for revision. Um, uh, you know, students don't necessarily get excited about it straight away, but as it gets coded to exams, it can be. Uh, but also just in case there's ever been a need to, to flag up uh, anything at all. Um, so so that, that's, that's how that works. And the other question, Lauren, that was about uh, matching and whether um, schools get a say in matching, was that right? Yep. Um, so uh, to that point, so the, the, the one thing that we do do a match for at the moment is uh, gender. So we believe that students, you know, by and large, um, should be matched with either gender, just, just making sure it's the right tutor for them rather than gender specific. But there are some girls and boys schools where um, there's a bit more, um, you know, the, the, the whole school expectation is, is one thing or the other. So we can do some matching on that. Other than that, what we try to do is take the information you've given us about the student, make sure we have the best match possible for those students. And, you know, uh, occasionally that, that, that relationship, most 99% uh, of the time, those relationships are brilliant. Our tutors are already trained really well in, in establishing all that rapport and everything. But if there's ever a, a situation where there's a, a student and a tutor doesn't click right away, um, it's no problem at all and, and we can swap them. But I, I should hope that's the, that's the exception rather than the rule, Will. Is that, is that fair? Uh, yeah, we only had uh, one change of tutor and it, it, you're dealing with human beings and sometimes people just don't click. And what I will say is when we had that tutor swapped out for another one, it happened instantaneously and there was no questions asked. And you just phone your link. You get like a link member of staff that you're constantly dealing with for your school and you just give them a ring and they swap the tutor out for the next session. And it wasn't because the tutor wasn't very good and it wasn't because the student was really naughty. It's just about personalities and human beings. And sometimes you just need to give it a different. And it was that one, a change of gender that made the difference. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here which is um, pertinent to sort of the NTP. Um, so, question around how will three to one tuition work on my tutor? Obviously, we've spoken a lot about the one to one benefits, but what will three to one look like in terms of the NTP? Um, sorry, Lauren, can you say that? Because that's, that's a case of that's a in terms of practically how it differs. Yeah, I think the, uh, the question was just around um, we because we've been speaking about one to one. Um, are we going to offer three to one? How will it work? Um, that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. No. No bother. So that works in in uh, in much the same way that that one to one works, and that, and obviously that's part of the national tuition program um, criteria. Um, so essentially, it's a little bit like uh, the screen that I might have showed you earlier, where you can see uh, the tutor. Except what will happen is it's three students logging onto three devices uh, and all working, so they won't be huddled around a computer or anything like that. It's exactly the same in a three to one environment. So um, obviously, we know, and I've got plenty of, of record on on the impact of, of one to one over the last few years three to one we also know from the, the EF's toolkit to be to be really effective um, so that's that's how it's being offered uh, this year as a, as a sort of an extra to um, the other one-to-one -one stuff that's going on if that, if that makes sense great thank you um, actually I have a question for Will now so um, this is from uh, Gareth so Gareth, Gareth, Gareth's asking, Will mentioned the gap analysis to be able to front load the tutoring. How do you collect and collate the gap information? Okay, so in our core subject, well in all subjects, but for our core subjects, students sit a, a rehearsal exam, we don't call them mock exams, they sit their rehearsal exams and then when the, student, when the teachers mark those papers, um, the students get a um, printed out gap analysis and they're ragged and it's done on how many whether they get the marks for those questions and then what we do is the ones that are highlighted red are the gaps and those gaps are the ones that we use my tutor to plug i hope that makes sense thank you will um okay i have another question here this one will be for rich i think um so this is a question from ned um do the students have to have a teacher with them in the room if it's happening at school? If so, the evidence you've spoken about leading to improvement appears to be indicating just further targeted revision 
that the further targeted revision is what's helping the student. So would it not be more effective to just use a member of staff in the room with them to do that? So I think that's a great question. I think so. There's a couple of reasons why um, the I think that that's that's uh, that's you know there's 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 more impact in, in in using tuition in that environment. So first of all, you're quite right. In a room where you've got 20, 30 students, you at least want a HLTA in there who's making sure they're all logged on and not snickering and, and all that kind of stuff in the room. That that of course when it's in school that's what you want to happen um, in terms of uh, the impact side of things i think there's a couple of things one is that the scale of individualized tuition you can get in that room so all of a sudden you can have a room with 20 25 30 students in there each having one-to-one -one individual lessons with a tutor so in that way it's not really comparing like for like in terms of having one uh, teacher with with one student um, and, and then i suppose the second thing is that uh, the tutors are I think you can you know, they can never replace what teachers do in the classroom what teachers do in the classroom is is still the most important part of learning in schools all they can do is complement it and they can complement it in a really good way because they're as I say closer in age they can the one-to-one -one environment allows them to ask questions they might feel a little bit silly about asking in smaller groups and um, those kind of things and also sometimes someone who's just not the normal school person that you're speaking to sometimes it can just click in a different way it's just exposure to another person uh, i don't know if nick or, or uh, sorry if nikki or, or will have any comments on that but but those would be uh, my perception hopefully it answers your question great thank you rich um okay i have a kind of a logistical question here which might be a good one for for nikki or will um but how does the t how does timing the sessions logistically work with school timetabling matching to tutor availability around lectures labs etc um perhaps it'd be good to hear how you guys sort of work that in terms of the timing of your sessions and perhaps rich maybe as well you could talk about how we manage it on our side do you want to go first nikki okay i'll, I'll go on that one so uh the key is having that key member of staff, that single point of contact. That, um, so um, what we do is when you upload or onload the students, you will have um, on there, you have to choose the slots you want. So for us, lesson one, 8.30 to 9.30 is lesson one. And that's the slot that, type, that my tutor, find the tutors and they fill those slots for you. The key thing is that you need to look ahead and be really well planned to book what my tutor referred to as holidays. And that's when you might have, um, it's, it just happens to fall on the day when it's a development day. Make sure you book it in as a holiday and make sure you book all your half terms in in the correct place. Make sure you book in when year 11 are all on the geography field trip because they're doing their um, coursework. All those sorts of things need to be pre-planned when you do the onloading. Um, my experience was we had no issues i just said these are the slots that we need over to you my tutor you find the tutors and they facilitate the slots that you need well very similar experience for us too yes we were just able to say when we could make it work in school um and it was over to my tutor to make it make the matches Brilliant. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Rich? Or no, I think that's I think that's about right. Um, logistically, we could start on the quarter hour, um, and that seems to, one of those seems to work pretty well with with school timetables, uh, usually. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so I had a, a couple of people asking this question um, about the MyChoose platform. So just to clarify, is it Zoom? Uh, is it our own platform? What is it? Um, good question. So it's uh, it's our own platform. Um, you know, it, it's not. It's it's um, it's purpose built for running sessions in schools. So the idea is, it's not supposed to take a lot of bandwidth to be able to utilize. Um, we want it to all be online so that we could, um, so that people could just drop in and log in without having to download any software or anything like that. And that was always the risk with things like Zoom. And also it allows us to have control over the lesson space and how uh, we can make that quite a functional space for students and tutors to use their keyboards and mice to, 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 uh, to interact on there. So yeah, it's our own, it's our own platform. 
works awesome. really well with Google Chrome as well because we're a Google school. I don't know, not all schools are Google schools, but we're a Google school and it was really functionally worked well with Google Chrome. Thanks, Will. Um, okay, this one is probably for Rich. Um, it's around the NTP because the NTP is obviously a, a program with a huge amount of scale. Um, so bearing in mind that, um, how, what's the likely demand that we expect? Um, how much capacity might we have? Um, and how many pupils do, do we sort of hope to reach? Well, I mean, I can't, I can't speak exactly to, uh, we bid for a certain amount of students that we believe we can help and, and actually can do at a scale that um, that, that is, is the right level. So to give you some context, you know, we delivered, uh, we'll deliver about 150,000 lessons this calendar year um, to, to, to students. Um, so we've, we've got a number that we're comfortable with. We think, and, and don't, don't quote me on this. The government's got a, a number of about 250,000 to 300,000 students, but that seems to be cross phase uh, and with particular focuses on certain areas uh, for the three, for the, and this is specifically for the three to one stuff. So it looks like from the website, year seven, 10 and 11 are core focuses, year six as well. Um, so obviously we know that that's not going to be able to cover every every student in the country. And so that's why I suppose student schools are doing a bit of a hybrid of one-to-one -one targeted stuff three to one stuff that sits on the NTP, three to one that might sit on outside the NTP. Um, so so that's, that's about what we know so far. So what we know is that it's extensive, but it won't be cons, uh, cons, consummate. And so, you know, making use of things like catch up funding and stuff like that will, will also come into play for schools. Um, so our, our perspective on this is that, um, you know, where, where schools are, are looking at a hybrid approach where they're looking at both one-to-one -one and three-to-one that provides a, a sustainable platform for more schools to get access. Great, thank you. Um, so a question here around communication. Um, how is feedback and progress communicated from tutors back to heads of department or teachers so that learning can be reinforced in the classroom? um rich could you answer that one yeah sure so uh, in terms of feedback and progress um i, I suppose uh, hopefully will and nikki you'll have seen this but um what every teacher gets access to everyone who's involved in the program so not just will but also other members of the team get access to is a teacher portal so you can see things like attendance um you can also see that after every lesson the tutor leaves a lesson report and um, that's you know what what they're struggling with what they've been working on today but you can see that it's lining up with what you've asked for in the learning gaps but you can also see where they're making progress which is also quite it's also great for the department leads to be able to take back in terms of of keeping a complementary flow between the two uh, the two pieces thanks rich um so there's a question here around accountability. Um, is accountability shared? Do those who receive the tutor who do not reach their target, does the DFE take this into account? I'm not sure I 100% um, understand this question, but I think perhaps it's around, it feels like the question there is around how well do we measure impact? Um, and Oh, I, think, on that. I think I've got a sense of this one from Gerald and tell me if you're wrong Geraldine it looks a little bit like because there's the government piece around um, because there's a government piece around um, uh, uh, you know what they what they're expecting from exams and everything next year we have no idea in terms of what accountability is across there I mean I, the government I don't think seem to be seem to be hitting everyone in the country so we don't know um, anything really about whether how accountability works in terms of working on this or, or off this you know there's a there's a lot probably still to be revealed in terms of next year's exams and how all that pans out so uh, sorry we can't be more helpful with that thanks rich um i think a few people have, are wanting to dig in a little bit more into the stat that we mentioned earlier around the grade of progress that students make um with us so Rich, do you mind talking in a tiny bit more detail about the methodology for that? Um, how do, what's our measurement process in when we come to produce our report and how did we arrive at that stat? I think you might have touched on it, but perhaps I think people maybe just want a bit more detail. In terms of the impact report? 
yeah and yeah the, the grade impact that we talk about yeah absolutely so i suppose it's just that what we do is we we take that baseline uh, mock grade which is taken from obviously school information and school data um and then what we have a look at is after they've run 10 sessions with us where are they at in the next stage of examination so we take those data points both times from the school so initially during mocks and then also again um you know during the summer exam period and, and how that works after that so what we then do is we compare the progress in terms of how much they've moved from one grade to another um, and so actually the way that works is um, it might be a four to a five it might be a you know a four to a six it might be a seven to a nine or whatever and then we put all of that together and aggregate it and so that's what brings out um, one grade of progress versus 0.4 amongst uh, non-tutored my tutor subjects um, but also really happy to to talk you through that methodology in a bit more detail um, it's uh, it's really interesting in terms of how we go about that and actually i think david might have even shared it the uh, the eef we had a uh, we had a, we had a well it's interesting we uh, all all already i mean we've been doing it for what five six years already uh, and working with schools but we had an eef program lined up for this september actually um, and obviously with everything that's gone on with COVID, the, the pressures on recruiting schools, uh, I think the EEF was very aware that September wouldn't be a normal September. Uh, and so that's back to next year, but that will be excellent because it will just help to add validation to the stuff we already uh, have worked out on our end and, and the stuff that Will and Nikki and stuff work out in school. So the more the merrier, uh, really looking forward to doing that. But yeah, that's, that's next year now, unfortunately. Great, thank you. Um... So I'm seeing quite a few questions from people who just want a bit of clarity on pricing. Um, Rich, can you explain how our pricing works in terms of um, per hour or lesson, that kind of thing? There's lots of questions of various um, iterations of that. Uh, in terms of pricing? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So the way it works is um, for one to one tuition, the, the price ranges between 22 and 26 pounds an hour. Uh, so what we try to do is have it as fairly flat. Um, and that basically ranges between once you're using 30 students to support, it's 22 pounds an hour. Um, from a group tuition perspective, we don't know exactly what the government's going to shake that out at, but it looks like it might be about 45 pounds an hour for three to one group tuition. So about 15 pounds a pupil. Great, thank you. Um, so I have a question here that might be good for either Nikki or, or Will. Um, it's around sort of pupil incentivization and rewards. So Will, you talked about a rewards um, pyramid. Uh, it would be great to hear a little bit more about um, what type of rewards you offered. So right at the bottom of the period, it's that simple instant hit straight away when they turn up to the My Tutor room, even if it's lesson one or lesson four or after school, there's tea and coffee for them. So they can have a tea and coffee, instantly makes them feel special because we live in the instant culture where they want things now. So that's like your instant reward. The next layer was the prom passport. So they have a passport for all lesson sixes, all interventions. If they successfully complete it, there's the signature on their prom passport they get 10 percent off if they complete the passport it's 10 percent off their prom ticket at the end of the year um but right to the top the biggest reward is just banging on about the impact it will have on their results their outcomes and their futures so that the, the language is driven around their results with the nice little things around it Thank you, Will. Nikki, did you do anything um, similar around rewards or is there anything you could share on um, how did you incentivize pupils? We just didn't really have to, to be honest. They were very much on board with it. Um, very much about making sure that they do better uh, and making sure they understood that this was something we were doing specifically for them, tailored for them and making them feel quite special about it which meant we just didn't need to incentivize it in the end. I mean, so much of it is in, is in the framing. We have a school, a school in Stoke where Will gets up on a, an assembly and says, if you, you know, based on their own internal data, nothing else, they say, look, this is the progress if you do your homework, this is the progress if you do this, and this is the progress if you do my tutor. And eventually you just creates a bit of a, of a culture around it, but there's nothing wrong with a few incentives. I know that, sorry, he's also called Will Will, which is just for the confusion there. He, uh, he, there are incentives there as well. So 
definitely positive framing is probably the most valuable thing you can do, but there's, you know, a little, a little prize in there as well can, can go quite away. Great. Thank you. Um, I have another question here about targeting earlier years. So there's a question here from someone called Will, who says, do Will or Nikki see benefit to targeting earlier years or would they always focus on year 11? So I'll throw that one out there. So to either of you. I think if we were, we had the um, funding to do so, we'd definitely use it in other year groups. I can't see anything but good things about that. It is just about what funding you have uh, and where you choose to direct that. And that's the reason why most of us end up going for exam classes. But if you can make it work lower down, I'm sure it'd be very beneficial. I agree. It's finance driven, definitely. Thank you both. Um, okay, so this is quite a simple question. Um, but it's around, instead of using a computer room, is it possible for students to use individual iPads? Um, so that's one. And these are two sort of actually closely related tech questions. So one, can students use iPads? And two, um, how does it work with noise um, and headphones? Because uh, there's a question around whether students get distracted by hearing each other talk. Good question. So I can speak to a bit about tablets. I don't know if, if uh, Nikki, well, you'll have seen it in, in classes, so you can say about whether the noise is, uh, is, is distracting. I, I, um, the tablets work. So um, tablets are fine as long as you have a pair of, of headphones. Phones don't really work. I mean, you can't get the functionality of the lesson space on there. So a lot of the benefit of it's actually lost, I think. Um, so that, that's what we'd say. Um, in terms of in class, from, I've, you know, when we've been to schools, it, it's amazing how quiet it gets whilst they're still also individually having communication with the tutors. I don't know if, if you guys have, have found that or what you've seen. Uh, it's just key to have the right headphones. So we just invested in the headphones, a bit like what Richard's wearing there with a headset. So um, it cancels out all that noise. And the most you get in the room is just the hum of chatter between them and their tutor. So th the headphones are key. You wouldn't be able to do it without headphones. Yeah, again, we agree um, with the same sort of headphones and no distraction, really. Pupils just absorbed periods when they're very quiet and concentrating, periods when they're chatting through issues, but never at any point did it look like it was distracting anybody. Thank you both. Um, OK, I have another question here around lockdowns, which has actually just vanished. Uh, okay, here we go. This is from Jackie. If we were to go back into lockdown, would the my tutor sessions continue, uh, and would students have access at home as a temporary plan? So, Rich, that might be one for you. Might have, might I just you sort of pinged out a little bit there, <laughs> Lauren? What did you oh, say? Oh, sorry, Rich. That was a question about lockdown. Would mm. the my tutor, if 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 we were to go back into lockdown, whether that's national or local? Could my tutor sessions continue uh, if students have access at home on a temporary basis? Uh, yes. So and I think that's that's probably fairly valid. I think the only thing that we ask is that lessons continue on a scheduled basis. So uh, obviously where they where they have to suddenly go home, we can be flexible and we can change timings. But where you can keep the timings at the same, even if they're doing it at home, then, then they get the same tutor. That's just for a bit of tutor consistency there. Great, thanks Rich. Um, Rich, can you give a bit of an overview of just a few questions around this uh, in terms of who my tutor are, why we were set up, a um, couple of people asking are we a charity, could you just clarify on that? Yeah, good questions. So um, uh, we were set up I mean, on the school side, we've been doing things on the on the consumer side for for seven seven years or so, where parents can sign up to to tuition themselves for those who can ordinarily afford it. the The schools program, which is obviously designed around uh, providing it to those who ordinarily don't have access, we established that about about five years ago or so. Um, and so James Grant is the co-founder of of my tutor. Um, in terms of whether we're a, we're a charity, we're not a charity, um, although we're also not profitable. So it's not, um, well, I think the most important things to, 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 to talk about are that, first of all, 
Um, it's interesting actually because the person on our one of the people on our board is is Anne Marie um, Huby, who is actually the co-founder of Just Giving. Um, and what we've got is a fairly similar um, model in that essentially by being a not but by being a for-profit for good business, we're able to attract who we think are great tutors, great team members, all those kind of things. But then also we're not a high, uh, well, we're not, we don't, we don't make a profit and we're not a, certainly not a high margin business by any stretch. So what that means is we can keep prices. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, when you heard those, you'll have heard the right, that, that they are um, keep them as low as possible so that actually we can keep it accessible um, but also hire great people to make sure that we can deliver at the scale that that, that schools are, are asking of us um, hopefully that clarifies a couple of questions there I think also someone was asking about um, who's running the session so that's right I mean hopefully you've gotten an invite from from us at my tutor and that's uh, that's that's who's running the session we've just got some information on the, the national tuition program for you Thanks, Rich. Uh, very simple question here. Uh, do you only focus on core or is it available across all subjects? Core is our absolute major focus, mostly because that's what schools ask for. And it's also where they're really brilliantly trained. We have some um, we have some some tangential subjects that we can get a little bit. I don't know if Will or Nick, you did any sort of tangential stuff, but it tends to be on a much smaller basis. Not chicken your head, you know, a bit of history, some some of the EBAC stuff. So history, some MFL, not German. Strangely, we have very low supply in German, but we do a little bit of that. But for the most part, focusing on core uh, hopefully reflects um, the needs that, that you have, especially at GCSE level. Thanks, Rich. Um, so I'm conscious that we are probably getting down to the last few minutes now um, in terms of questions and the end of the webinar. So a few questions from people around next steps on the NTP um, in terms of how do they access it. Um, Rich, can you shed any light on, on that in terms of the timings and what schools can do next? Yes. Yes. So um, from what we gather, um, the government is going to, uh, they're going to, uh, the EEF actually, uh, so the EEF are, are, are making the call on, on, on partners themselves. Um, and, and that announcement is expected to be made formally at the end of October, uh, although we suspect we'll know a bit earlier in October how it is so that we can plan with schools. So um, we'll be chatting with our existing schools through, through October and I think we're happy, to, we're able to share information. So where it's a part of where you think it's something that is interesting um, we're happy to sort of talk to you about it and, and 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 get some more detail on it so that we sort of know once it is formally a thing that we can talk about uh, we can share even more detail than that so hopefully that's not too fluffy we suspect it's sort of end of October is the official timeline but we'll know more in the next week or so about about uh, how it works and, and from what our sense is um, schools should be able to fairly freely um, speak to, to, to us if that's what they want to do. Great, thank you, Rich. Um, just lastly, um, someone's asked Will and Nikki, um, what is your percentage of, percentage of disadvantaged pupils? Um, that was one question. Um, so Will and Nikki, it would be great to hear from you on that. And then also, Will, what is the total number of students you used this for last academic year? Okay, so uh, our percentage of pupil premium, year seven to 11, is 52% of our school currently um, pupil premium. Um, the first group round sessions, it was um, 50 students. And then um, the summer holiday program, we offered it to 111 students. So quite a substantial offer. So we have a smaller proportion of disadvantaged students, um, only a, a less than 20%. Um, but that sometimes can make it quite difficult because that's where schools tend to struggle when they have a small cohort. Uh, this just enables you to really focus it. And we would be going for lower numbers. We'd be looking at choosing, um, say, 30 students that we thought would really benefit from it. Thank you both. I think that probably just about wraps us up in terms of time. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to get to absolutely all the questions. Uh, just run out of time there. Um, but hope we managed to answer as, as many of them as, as, uh, as we possibly could. Um, and I'll hand over to Rich now.
Yeah, absolutely. Should I bring up my old wrap up notes? Um, so yes, I suppose, thank you very much for, for attending uh, this afternoon. Hopefully it was really informative and, and useful. There are a hundred more questions on there that, that would be really interesting to get to, although unfortunately we, sorry we couldn't get to them all. So you've got my email here. I think Lauren's gonna collate some of the questions as well that we didn't get a chance to speak to. So we'll definitely um, try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, this is, was recorded. So uh, should be able to get access to it afterwards and we'll send it out to anyone who couldn't make the whole session. So no need to worry there. Um, please do fill out the post webinar survey form if you can. It's really good to see what's actually useful. Um, you know, obviously we love getting teachers on to, to, to speak a bit more directly because it's, it's usually more interesting than, than what we can say. So um, please do fill that out and let us know. Um, and then you've got here uh, access to, to my email directly if you wanted to reach out about anything else at all. Um, so. Um, thank you very much for, for attending this afternoon. Um, hope best of luck for the rest of the week in the next few weeks um, and, uh, and speak to you all speak to you all soon. See you later. Have a nice evening.